Hello everyone and uh, welcome to today's event on uh, translating great Russian literature. Uh, I'm going to hand over in just a minute to uh, host, which is Connor Daly, um, who will introduce our speaker. But just before I do, I'd like to take you through some housekeeping uh, points. So um, today's event is being recorded and uh, if you wouldn't mind, please remain mute throughout but we do very much welcome your questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, then please do post it in the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. So you just you just click the button and then you can just type away to all of us. And Connor will get through as many of those questions as he can. Uh, we expecting quite a large audience today. So it may be that you can't get through every one of them, so we uh, encourage you, if you didn't manage to uh, ask your question, uh, uh, live, that uh, you could actually follow us on YouTube. Uh, the event will be on YouTube later, and you'd be very welcome to add your comments there, and we can continue the conversation. So, without any further ado, I'll pass on to uh, my colleague Connor. Good afternoon, everybody, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Kathy McAteer. Kathy is postdoctoral fellow at the University of Exeter. Her main project is called The Dark Side of Translation, and it sheds light on the people behind the translation process. So that network of agents that go into the making of a seamless translation, not just the translator, him or herself. Now, Kathy's special area of interest is the Penguin Russian Classics series. I need to, at this point, declare um, community of interest uh, with Kathy here because it was that very series that brought me back in the 1970s into the the whole area of, of Russian studies. Here's a selection from the packed shelf behind me that has many more. Uh, this, so this series, a prism, if you like, that brought me into Slavic myself, although I would say that I don't recommend if you haven't read it, uh, tackling the back cover of Anna Karenina because it tells you what happens in the end. So uh, avoid that one. And uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy's book, her recent book called Translation, Translating Great Russian Literature, the Penguin Classics, has been published this year by Rutledge and is available on open access. And it is that, Translating Great Russian Literature, the Penguin Classics, which is the subject of Kathy's talk to us today, which I greatly look forward to. So over to you, Kathy. Thank you. Hello there, thank you very much, Connor. Thank you uh, to James, thank you Ethne for organizing everything. And thank you Connor for agreeing to moderate today's talk. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And, uh, and I'm really very grateful to the huge number of people who've also tuned in. Uh, perhaps if we're going to have a single uh, silver lining from the COVID situation is that these events are now thrown open uh, to a far wider audience. So that's uh, especially lovely. Um, what I'm going to do is share my screen uh, because I have some slides that I'd like to um, uh, use today. And uh, then uh, once I've finished um, my presentation, then I'll, I'll come back and we'll hopefully have time for any questions or nostalgia uh, amongst the audience, um, because this is a, a series that, as Connor has already intimated, a lot of people feel very fondly about. So um, that's, that's my hope. So my talk is um, just over half an hour or so, and then hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about the books uh, some of which you can see on this opening slide. Um, that's just a small selection. And then there's this book as well, which has already been introduced. In, uh, here it is in full uh, glorious Technicolor, but it's also actually a real book. It's not just an image, it does exist. Um, in the times that we're in where there is extremely restricted access to library resources, uh, I just want to point out again, it's available for um, free download, fully accessible. Uh, and that's thanks to the uh, funding I received from the Rostrans project, which itself gets its funding from the European Research Council, and also the wonderful open access team at Exeter University, where I'm based. Um, they very uh, helpfully all have funded this open access version. So go to the Taylor and Francis um, website and click on the link and you'll be able to read the whole thing for yourselves. 
Right, so uh, if you've actually gone to the trouble of tuning in today, for which I'm very grateful, it's possible that you have an interest in Russian literature and translation, Penguin books, the Penguin Russian classics series, translator history, and book history. It could be any of those, but this book, the, the, my book, actually fuses all of those aspects. Uh, you have the whole thing in one, one book, um, and the book is based on my doctoral research, and um, it focuses on uh, the Penguin Classic series, the Medallion uh, series, which you can see here. Here's my copy of it. This is what they first looked like. Um, these were published between 1950 and 1964. There are 16 Russian classics in that particular uh, mini series, um, and they were brought out to give a modern cadence to those Russian classics. Uh, and uh, in doing so, it provided an affordable and accessible format. So they were signified by that red color code, by the red border, the creamy white background. And if you can see from my copy, there's a roundel on the front cover. Uh, that's a, a text specific black and white illustration. Cunningly on the spine, there's a number and it's a collectible number. Uh, and there was great logic in that, in that they want, Penguin wanted to appeal to the collector in all of us. Um, we've seen from Connor's collection, I've got a collection, um, who could bear to have a half filled shelf. So um, what better thing to do, put a number on it and uh, really flag it up that there were more to buy. Um, and this effectively is Penguin's uh, relaunch of the classic Russian literary canon in English in the mid 20th century. Um, the very first Penguin classic book was published in 1946. I'll come on to that in a moment, but that is the same year that Constance Garnett died. So this is the great relaunch that's coming after Constance Garnett. And uh, thanks to my postdoctoral role on the Rust Trans project, I've actually been able to extend my archival research to include publications up to the mid 1980s. Um, the interesting thing once we get to the mid 1980s, of course, is that means of correspondence changes. So um, the material gets less and less in the archive. So uh, they're beginning to use fax, telex, um, telephone a lot more, and of course, uh, computers are beginning to take off. So there is a restricted uh, element to that archival research, but uh, the mid 1980s, that uh, reaches an era of the lesser known 19th century classics. Retranslations are being discussed of those key classics uh, that of the earlier medallion series. And there's also the arrival of Soviet dissident literature. So my book covers that too. And then uh, not using so much archival research, I've brought it up to more present day literature. So my key research interest therefore has been to understand the how, the why, who and when of Penguin's Russian Literary Translation Commission. And these are leading questions. And in order to find the answer to those questions, it's required something of a synthesis of methodologies. Uh, so I've applied sociological, archival, uh, and good old fashioned textual analysis. Uh, but in this case, the textual analysis has been with a view to matching, uh, with the aid of archival material, a translator's practice with their personal and professional bearing, their dispositions, their life events. Um, the person who's helped me with this is this gentleman, it's Pierre Bourdieu, and it's his sociology that's been applied during the past two decades of, by translation scholars to shine a light not on the text, nor particularly on the cultural factors framing a translation, but on the people, the social agents, as he calls them, who are all interconnected in a mutually serving network to create what he would call a symbolic good. It's what I would call a book translated text um, and it's something that transcends geographical intellectual and social borders and I've also incorporated an extension of that this is Jeremy Monday's um, extension of the sociological turn and that is namely a micro historical approach put simply that's the application of primary archival material as a way of constructing a micro history of my penguin translators but in my case, I've extended the exercise uh, to include, as you'll see in my book, other agents in the process too. Uh, so that's the publisher, Alan Lane, it's his editors, advisors, and translators. 
The key sites for my research have been the Penguin Archive. Now there's more than five kilometers worth of archive housed at the University of Bristol. I really should stress at this point that um, they're only a comparatively tiny section of that five kilometers plus uh, actually is dedicated to the Penguin Russian translations. There are really just 23 folders for the key uh, element of my research. There's also the Leeds Russian Archive at Leeds University, uh, and there's the CIS Archive at UCL. Before I introduce the translators themselves, I would actually just like to spend a moment uh, setting the scene and introducing some figures who were instrumental in Penguin's relaunch of that uh, literary canon. And the first person I want to introduce is this gentleman. <clears throat> This is Sir Alan Lane. He's the founder, the patron of Penguin Books. Uh, it was his economic capital, risk and innovation that was pledged in order to fund, publish, promote and sell his portable paper, paperbacks. Paperbacks being synonymous with Penguin. They were modern looking, eye catching. They all had that memorable logo, the Penguin that we love. And for Lane, accessibility on all levels was key. He wanted his Anglophone every man, woman and child to enjoy a good book, uh, and in this particular case, a good Russian book. Uh, penguins were accessible not just in terms of their retail outlets, so you may well be aware that they were available on railway stations, in bookshops, obviously, uh, at Woolworths department store, and in the delightfully named Penguincubator vending machines, um, quite a wonderful name. They were accessible in terms of size, uh, so they were pocket sized, so immediately portable, and in terms of cost, they were all pitched uh, initially at the price of a packet of cigarettes. But beyond the physical, he also wanted them to be accessible in terms of content, their language, that they must appeal to but not patronize a mass audience. And this audience was the new wave of the post-war, self-educating, self-improving British working class. Now, Lane was the first to admit there were gaps in his own skills. Uh, he actually left school with very little by way of examination results, um, but he had the, the foresight to actually seek agents with experience and talent, the people who could fill those gaps. And in many respects, these are his series editors. So they were recruited for their intellectual capital. They had market knowledge and literary expertise, they had advisory and um, language-based contacts of their own. And certainly the Penguin Classics editors uh, enjoyed a very high degree of autonomy. They were very much left to their own devices. Alan Lane put his trust in them. Now, key to the entire Penguin Classics series is this gentleman, the rather formidable looking series editor. This is Emile Victor Ria. And uh, it's his translation of Homer's Odyssey that launched Penguin Classics in 1946. He himself had previously had a career in publishing at Methuen, but during the Second World War, he decided that uh, an evening activity might be translating Homer's Odyssey. So that's what he did. And his um, translation, his, his publication with Penguin came with a mission statement. It was that they should produce readable, attractive versions of the great writers' books in good modern English. Uh, and that statement would influence the entire medallion series and the manner in which uh, Russian literature would then be brought to the modern audience. So Ria set to work consulting his contacts and tapping into his networks in order to find translators and texts that could be included in his series. He didn't do uh, all of this entirely alone. There was another gentleman who helped him. This is the copy editor, A.S.B. Glover, Alan Samuel Bates Glover. Um, he was employed by Lane as early as 1944, effectively without portfolio, but he was drafted in on account of his attention to factual and typographical errors. From the launch of Pen Penguin Books, Glover, who also had previously had publish publishing experience at Routledge and Keegan Paul at Odden's and Reader's Digest, he had read and corrected every publication and notified Penguin of all the changes that he felt they, they might want to implement in future publications. Uh, so um, he also added that uh, their, their problems in print and um, 
misprinting and typos hadn't impeded his enjoyment of the text. Um, while he had never been to university, uh, and this is a fact which in, uh, apparently inflamed his urge to omniscience, he had spent time in various prisons for his conscientious objection. He was detained for four years at Her Majesty's pleasure uh, in various institutions and uh, Glover, whilst he was there, used his time well. He memorized the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Wisdom's Cricketer's Almanac, Bradshaw's Railway Guide, Greek and Hebrew literatures. Um, he had a photographic memory and an ongoing interest in religion, which at some point in his life had also prompted him to have multiple tattoos. Uh, to the extent that they were even visible through holes in his socks. Um, perhaps uh, of most relevance of all to today's talk is that he was himself a translator of medieval Latin and French. So Lane had two practicing translators at the editorial helm of the Penguin Classic series. Now, uh, Edie Ria maintained that it is the translator's job to make the text explain itself remembering always that it is not erudition that we want to teach, but appreciation. So what he then did was consciously strive to break from the idea of translation by scholars for scholars. In fact, he initially invited Oxbridge Dons to um, com com submit sample translations that might be used, but he decided that they were too far too Stuck with the scholarly idiom. And instead, he then went on and commissioned non-scholarly translators for their linguistic, cultural, and their literary capital. Uh, if you go to Penguins Online A to Z of first editions, there's a section on translators there. And it admits that translators are very much a hidden group of people. We think of the title of the book and the author. We may remember the image of the front cover. But the person who's transformed the novel, poem, or nonfiction book from another language into English and made it a delight to read is often overlooked. And if you attempt to glean any background information about the early Russian translators, a blank is drawn nearly every time. So yes, they're very hidden indeed. Um, these men and women have the briefest biographies, if any, and in nearly all cases, there's little mention of how editor and translator forged their relationship in the first place. Early record keeping was sporadic at Penguin and recruitment was often relaxed, taking place over boozy lunches in Soho or at Ria's club at the Athenaeum. Thankfully, uh, it's the archives that have helped me to piece together a snapshot of personalities and an insight into the working relationships and commercial decisions at Penguin. So let's move on to the translators, these translators. Uh, these four are of particular interest. Uh, they arrive when uh, Penguin's Russian classics are just getting underway. So they are Gilbert Gardiner, Elizaveta Fenn, David Magashak, and Rosemary Edmonds. And for today's purposes, I'm actually going to um, talk about David Magashak last, because uh, I have quite a lot to say about David Magashak. Uh, so we'll start with Gilbert Gardner. He was the translator of Turgenev's On the Eve. It, this was first published in 1950. Um, this was the very first Penguin Russian classic. It wasn't the first to be commissioned. Um, however, it was the first to actually be published. And to all intents and purposes, his commission was a model one. Uh, there's a certain sense of excitement going to the archive, uh, knowing that this is the very first book and you uh, approach the file with great expectations. And then when you open it, it's something of a disappointment because it is incredibly thin. It's, a, it's very much a threadbare file. Um, however, he appears to have been entirely satisfied with his terms and conditions. The Penguin editors entirely pleased with the translation itself and the transition from manuscript to bookshop was pretty straightforward. And yet, uh, if you are patient enough to get to the end of that thin file and just hang on in there, there is a surprise element to the commission. And that is a letter uh, Gardiner sent to Penguin on the 21st of April, 1976. That's 26 years after the initial release of his translation. And in that letter, he states that he has actually missed all the royalties for the entire period since 1951. 
So with 40,000 copies sold during that time, Gardiner was owed a sizable £633 or so, which is nearly £4,000 today. So we can deduce a couple of things from that, that um, Gardiner's polite wait of 26 years suggests he's in no real need for those finances. Translation is not his sole means of income. It just can't really be the case. And secondly, that uh, Penguin's accounts are in no rush whatsoever to dispatch those royalties unless directly asked for them. And there, is, there are other occasions of this in the, in the archives generally. Agatha Christie is known also to have had to really chivy to get her royalties. So the next person I'm going to talk about is Elizaveta Fenn, or as she was uh, known initially, Lydia Vibelievna Zivurtovich, who was born 1899 and died in 1983. And uh, this portrait of her is at the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, it sort of makes her look rather formidable, I think, as well. She studied Russian language and literature at Leningrad University before coming to Britain in 1925. She became Lydia Jackson after marrying a British citizen in 1929, but she adopted the pen name Elizaveta Fenn when she began writing her own novels, biographies, and translating Russian literature into English. Unfortunately, her novels and biographies are far less known. There are all sorts of letters in her archive in fact, effectively imploring publishers to take on her own writing, but actually she uh, carved a better niche for herself as a translator. The archive correspondence demonstrates that uh, Fenn was acquainted with E.V. Ria in an advisory capacity at an early stage in the Penguin Classics journey. We're not quite sure how they knew each other. It could have been through Methuen, it could have been through Oxford Link. Um, but Ria consulted her on the quality of sample translations. Rosemary Edmonds, who I'll be talking about in just a moment, she actually submitted at least two sample translations. Uh, there was a lot of humming and hawing over her particular um, quality as a translator. Um, but apart from checking sample translations, Ria also asked her for recommendations, which titles should be included in the series. Um, he often asked her whether uh, Constance Garnett's translators, uh, translations could be included as they were, whether they should be revised or just ignored altogether and completely start from scratch. And it was uh, Fenn who also acted as a go-between for her friend Gilbert Gardiner and Evie Ria. Uh, she herself translated other Russian authors for other publishing houses, uh, she, but she only translated Chekhov for Penguin. She had publications in 1951, 54 and 59. She very much wanted to translate more, but uh, Ria wouldn't let her loose until she'd fully grasped the English idiom. Is, is the, bottom line. So uh, undoubtedly her biggest contribution uh, to the Penguin Classics enterprise was the consultative role that she performed uh, for Ria in those early years. Now Rosemary Edmonds, she was born 1905 and died 1998 and originally worked as a translator to General de Gaulle at the Fighting France headquarters in London and on liberation in Paris. She was recruited by Ria, first commissioned in 1950, and she translated works by Tolstoy, starting with Anna Karenin, published in 1954, which was a frustratingly long wait for Edmonds, having been commissioned four years earlier. He then progressed to War and Peace in 1957, uh, and it was during that commission that she actually traveled to Russia for the very first time, which is rather reminiscent of Constance Garnett. Um, and uh, she then translated The Cossacks, Childhood, Boyhood, Youth, Resurrection, and woven uh, in amongst the, the Tolstoy, there are also um, Pushkin's The Queen of Spades and Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. So bearing in mind that she had to submit um, more than one sample translation before she was commissioned, uh, it makes Evie Ria's comments on her uh, typescript of Anna Karenian quite interesting. His verdict was, I have examined the text carefully and found it good, though I do not think she's one of our A-plus translators. I have also read the introduction, which is, in my opinion, a bit feeble, but not altogether rotten. So uh, not exactly a ringing endorsement, but uh, it's worth noting that Penguin translators were also expected to pen their own introductions. Um, they were expected to position the text, to sell it to the uninitiated reader. 
Now, Edmonds elicited an altogether more positive response from her editors when she decided to use the anglicized form Anna Karenina uh, without Karenina. Her approach was applauded, applauded by Glover, who noted that the English press would actually call Stalin's wife Madame Stalin and not Madame Stalina. So they felt that it was a reasonable decision on her part. This is not shared by one of her um, uh, letter writers who uh, wrote to Penguin and called it an act of violence and impudence. Um, so Edmund's biggest tension working for Penguin came in the form of unauthorized changes to her text, uh, in the form of spelling changes, punctuation, deletions. She coveted her decisions and she finally demanded written confirmation that her work should never be again be tampered with without her consent. Now, she uh, uh, got that wish in 1966. It was written into her contract, but unfortunately, her tenure also concluded that same year when uh, new editors, Robert Baldick and James Cochran, concurred that the quality of her translation had fallen below the required standard. Right, let's move on to David Magashak. So uh, like Edmonds, Magashak enjoyed a long career. He had 15 years uh, at Penguin and several major publications. There are seven in total at, at Penguin. Um, he's best remembered primarily for his translations of Dostoevsky for Penguin. And as you'll see from my book, his micro history forms a key part of my research. In spite of his novels, translations and biographies, there are 44 published works in total. When Magashak died in October 1977, his obituary in the Times made no mention whatsoever of any translation work and only hailed his work as a biographer. So you can understand my eagerness to actually rectify that. In a bid to better his obituaries efforts, I've pieced together archival evidence from Penguin, from Magashak's own private papers, and I've conducted interviews in order to create a detailed micro history of his life, but specifically his career. So he was born in Riga, then Russia in 1899. He emigrated in 1919, and his reasons for doing so were to escape anti-Semitic ed education legislation, which imposed a ceiling at that time on the number of Jews who were eligible for higher education. That's exactly what he wanted. So he left uh, Riga, he left behind his parents, who duly cut him off entirely. Uh, he left his sisters, who then later themselves emigrated to Israel, and he arrived in the UK with scarcely any English. He graduated four years later from UCL with a 2-1 in English language and literature, and he went immediately to work at Fleet Street as a journalist. He became a British citizen in 1931, which was unlike many of the Russian emigres at that time uh, in that wave who uh, actually preferred to keep the route back to Russia alive. But uh, Magashnak decided to stay, perhaps on account of the fact that he married the Yorkshire-born working class Cambridge graduate of English, Elsie, uh, with whom he had four children. So um, according to the interviews that I conducted with um, David Magashak's daughter, Stella, who unfortunately has since died, um, it, and it was a great privilege to be able to interview her actually and uh, take down some of the, the family details of Magashak's life. Apparently he absolutely loved English, England, the pub. Uh, he, he loved beer. He never returned to Russia. His children never learned Russian and he never spoke it at home. At first, he fancied himself a novelist. He wrote um, crime novels, three of which were published in English in the 1930s. If you happen to have the opportunity of being at the British Library, you can actually request copies and have a look for yourselves and have a quick read. They are very similar, actually, all of them. They all reveal his classic Russian roots and uh, his early Russian reading. So namely, there are re many references to Dostoevsky. There are societal Napoleons, overdue rent, there's murder, there are Porfiry style detectives, and even the opening line uh, to his first novel more than echoes another more famous opening line, which Magashak himself later translated for Penguin's Crime and Punishment in 1951. So uh, he couldn't resist uh, re re echoing the sultry Friday evening, uh, the hot evenings in summer. To his disappointment, however, uh, poor Magashak failed to reach Dostoevsky's crime writing success. 
in need of an income, he was forced to turn to translation after the war. His most auspicious move was to respond to Rieu's call for further translations, which might suit the burgeoning Penguin classic series. And his timing was perfect, actually. Uh, Magishat was employed to provide a replacement manuscript for the recently terminated Crime and Punishment Commission. It had initially been given to Frank Friedeberg Seeley, um, and after two years of working on it, um, uh, Seeley then terminated that contract. So uh, Magashak's arrival heralded the start of his relationship with Penguin, the delivery of the Crime and Punishment uh, Commission, and it also knit him very nicely to Ria and Glover. Their timings at Penguin overlap. Uh, Glover resigned in 1958, Ria retired in 1964, the same year as Magashak's last Penguin translation. So uh, Ria and Magashak actually overlapped on matters other than timings. They shared the same vision of making literature accessible to a wide audience, something which they both felt should be achieved through a principle of equivalent effect. In, 19, in the 1954 interview translating the Gospels, Ria called this principle the lodestar of the translator's art, adding that the best translation comes nearest to giving its modern audience the same effect as the original first had on its audiences. Now, 10 years later, Eugene Nider, uh, who wrote Principles of Correspondence and is now known for his views on dynamic equivalence, he credited uh, Ria and Phillips with coining that term, Phillips being Ria's co-translator, the Reverend Phillips. Um, Magashak's attempts at achieving his own textual appreciation rather than erudition manifest themselves in a variety of ways in his novels. Uh, and the examples I'm now going to give you are all from his translation for Crime and Punishment, which was published in 1951. What I'm going to do is give you a typical Russian 19th century ball scene. Um, this is obviously pre-revolutionary, but what I'm going to do is add some layers of Magashak effect and we'll see how it affects the authenticity of the original scene, or rather how Magashak tried to bring the text of Crime and Punishment to a British audience, an Anglophone audience. So this is effectively going to be a visual metaphor for Magashak's translation practice. So whilst we have Cupola and Kopec and Balalaikas in uh, his uh, translation, and they add a degree of Russian flavour to the target text, they appear against a more accessible British backdrop. So we get all of these Britishisms, if you like. So we've got the blithering idiot, uh, dirty ruffian, by Jove, talking rot, frightful old she-devil, and uh, the loveliest one of all, she's a peach. Um, <laughs> uh, we also then have these additional elements of culture-specific terms. So uh, the in English institution of the pub arrives, um, which is something obviously Magashak entirely bought into. And he neutralized uh, Russian culture specific references uh, for the benefit of his Anglophone reader. So the quintessentially Russian she uh, becomes cabbage soup, Kulibyaka is simply a pie, um, and the translationally troublesome Khlyab Sol. Uh, the uh, bread and salt hospitality ritual, if you like, uh, is omitted. It, there is no bread and there is no salt. Uh, it was just uh, deemed easier that way. And other realia is paraphrased. So, for example, a kichka sebisaram becomes a rather wordy traditional headdress of a married woman ornamented with beads. So he definitely took a long way around with some of his uh, paraphrasings. Um, like Edmunds, Magashak also chose to anglicize character names. He tried to make this element easy, um, and it perhaps reaches its pinnacle in Crime and Punishment by calling Raskolnikov Roddy, and that created a little bit of a stir amongst critics. It was regarded that he'd moved too far towards the target reader. But what he definitely did uh, was use an awful lot of Mr, Mrs and Miss, um, he frequently, uh, he significantly rather, reduced the frequency of patronymics. Uh, and these are elements that still get discussed. This, these are still bugbears for people reading Russian literature. They still, many people struggle with, um, with uh, the names. In Magashak's own words, he felt that the translator's ultimate aim was to avoid uncertainty or confusion in the target reader. So this was what he was trying to achieve. 
He also strove to domesticate dialogue in a way which Garnet famously did not. Um, he attempted to impart some idiomatic Englishness to his characters, to Dostoevsky's characters. And what emerges is something of a speech hybrid. Now this still is taken from the idiot. This is Rogozhin. He is the villainous character from the idiot um, who in the Russian does not speak with an elevated diction. And yet what we see here with Magashak's rendering, uh, this perfectly typifies it. So we have almost gentlemanly speak in one of those speech bubbles you, with use of things like old man. Um, and then we have something of a Dickensian Dostoevsky in the other speech bubble with an awful lot of double negatives. Uh, and this is how he tried to uh, create some sort of uh, vernacular. So he switches between the correct register of classic literature and inflections that, as Rachel May has delightfully put, um, are associated with a London bar fly. Now, supporting the Soviet translation view that there's no such formal thing as untranslatability, Magashak preferred to handle difficulties with, within the text rather than rely on footnotes. And it led him to use a range of other strategies from paraphrase to translation by omission, which isn't harmful per se, uh, but it risks descriptive loss or even erosion. And with this in mind, in the days before the internet and uh, lots of library resources, some of the references may have eluded the general reader. So Cyrus of Persia, the pianist Rubinstein, the province of Rizam, the Kazan Virgin, and the St. Anne's Ribbon may all have been a mystery, even in spite of Magashak's dedication to equivalent effect. <clears throat> now, though he was efficient and speedy and supported by his wife, Magashak wasn't the easiest freelancer for Ria and Glover to manage. He absolutely relied on translation for his income. Uh, there is an assertiveness in his letters, particularly over money matters, which contrasts greatly with Gilbert Gardiner. By 1964, a combination of persistence, assertiveness, and creeping questions over his, the quality of some of his work all combined to cause him to fall out of favor at Penguin. And those are the words used in the letters. Uh, his translation of Lady with Lapdog, that's Chekhov's Dama Sab Sabachki, marks the end of his career at Penguin. And it also coincides with Ria's retirement in 1964 and a new era of more scholarly Penguin classics, um, which I'll come on to in a moment. But it wasn't the end of Magashak's career. He continued to translate for other publishers, wrote his Pushkin biography, and in 1968, he embarked on a brand new route into translation theory. He was commissioned by the publisher Victor Gollinger to prepare a book specifically on the principles of literary translation from Russian into English, something which even today we would welcome. And as commissions go, it's very interesting for a number of reasons. Many translators even now question the relevance of translation theory in their practice. And yet here was one of Penguin's longest serving Russian freelancers lauding the relevance. Uh, Magashak's hybrid habitus, this mix of Russia and the West, comes through as never before in his theorizing. So by that translation theorizing, we get to know more about him, his mixed views, and his resulting translation strategy. And his commission came nearly a whole decade before the famed founder of translation studies. It's this gentleman who also featured at last week's talk at, um, at, at Trinity. It's James S. Holmes who confessed in 1977 that uh, there's a great many of us do not know Russian and have a frustrating feeling that there's a great deal going on that's inaccessible to us. So there are lots of question marks. Now, what Magashak would have done, he would have served as a bridge between those eras. He intended his book to explain exactly what was going on and what had been going on for the 20 years of his career and before. His preparatory research draws on general translation theory going back to the roots of the Western tradition, but also crosses time zones to the Soviet school of translation, with references to Tchaikovsky, Nikolai Lyubimov, and special criticism reserved for Vladimir Nabokov's translation uh, of Yevgeny Anyegin and literalism. He, what Magashak did was define his own theory through a mixed bag of translation strategy and history. He rejected literalism and footnotes, endorsed Dryden's paraphrasing, he preferred domestication and wholeheartedly embraced the Soviet view of Pirivod Iskustva, translation is art. Like Tchaikovsky, he felt it was imperative to scrutinize the whole contextualized package 
the author, society, history, culture, politics of a book before translating it. He regarded the translator as a creator of a new work, a genius, no less, sharing the same pedestal as the original author, uh, which in the case of Dostoevsky is a rather lofty position to put himself in. He felt that the translator should receive prizes, be rewarded and revered, and he effectively courted the best of both worlds. In the West, Magashak had paid a political translation work and associations with perhaps the most recognized and reputable publisher of the day. And in the USSR, he actively sought and gained literary recognition, quite an achievement for a Russian emigre in the Soviet press. He, he was featured in Literaturna Gazeta, Komsomolskaya Pravda, and Izvestia. Sadly, Magashak was unable to see his commission through to completion. He terminated his contract in 1973, perhaps through ill health, and died of lymphoma a few years later in October 77. Now, Magashak's departure from Penguin in 1964 had coincided with that change of editorship at Penguin Classics uh, on reti Ria's retirement in 1964. So there followed a change of mission, the pursuit of translations to suit a more discerning reader. Uh, the readership had changed, and now it was often undergraduates as well who were trying to fast track their way through set reading lists. And there was a, a consequently a change of translation cohorts. So this included people like Ronald Wilkes, Richard Freeborn, Paul Foote, Michael Glennie, Joshua Cooper, all of whom had received military language training at the Joint Services School for Linguists. Uh, they were drilled in translation to such an extent that Magashak, Edmonds and, Fe and Fenn would probably have found it hard to compete. Uh, these translators built on the achievements of that first cohort, who between them cultivated the new appreciation among general readers of Russian literature. Gardiner, Fenn, Edmonds and Magashak arguably paved the way for the Soviet literature which soon followed, and these were works by Gorky, then rapidly Solzhenitsyn, Bulgakov, Vainovich, Sholokhov, Vladimov and Tolstaya in the 70s, 80s and 90s requiring a whole new level of immersion, not just by the uh, translators, but by the Anglophone reader too, in Soviet politics, acronyms, stomp compounds, prison camp jargon, yet more names and unfamiliar locations extending beyond uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. So thanks to uh, these translators, their Penguin publishing network, and then these translators, the Soviet translators, um, general readers have been able to access Russian and Soviet literature as never before. So on that note, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and um, see if maybe you would also like to ask some of your own questions or share some of your nostalgia for the series. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Cathy, and I hope everybody can hear me. I, it's my pleasant duty to to facilitate the questions and we have three good questions here already before i introduce and rephrase the questions uh, for you to answer i'm going to ask one of my own um which is um just listening to the way you describe magar shak and his his um his habitus or his his personal circumstances i'm struck by um the persona of the translator as the kind of the star the impresario, the, the, the guy who, um, you know, he, he's a gatekeeper at the same time, he's proud, he, he has something special, he's an intermediary, he's a wizard, if you like. And I'm interesting, I'm interested to know your, your take on whether you think the persona of the, trans, the, the translator is always deemed to be erased, because one of the things I think you, you mentioned, or certainly is present in the book, is the idea of translations becoming outdated and you've given us some examples as to why that might happen with the way idiom develops so um is it my question is a general question is it inevitable that translators become um displaced oh that's a lovely question Connor. thank you um well i mean i guess the very fact that we have a um, a hashtag name the translator even now on social media suggests that they do get rather sidelined. However, um, I do think that um, Penguin, uh, in those, the medallion series and the black cover series, uh, I think they did actually quite a lot in trying to foreground the translator. The fact that they gave them a bio sketch at the very front of the book beneath the author, rather sort of puts them on a, a fairly level footing. Um, 
I think the early days, it probably helped very much that uh, Ria and Glover themselves were translators and they tried an awful lot to um, really, they were attentive to translators' needs. They were very flexible with deadlines. They sought the source text if the translators couldn't. Um, they, I, I have every sense that they very much respected the translator. However, um, as it becomes a much more commercial proposition, and there are real big figures at stake once we get to the Solzhenitsyn translations, um, there is a sense that the translator does get sidelined, uh, and that's probably evidenced best of all in Cancer Ward, where um, poor old um, Bethel and Berg, they actually get their names uh, left off the, the, the book completely. Uh, there is great regret that it's sold out uh, before anybody can actually rectify that error. They can't even pulp the, the, the damaged goods. Um, so yes, I think it's something that um, started out really well, has dwindled and perhaps has been uh, since then put back on the, the radar that uh, translators should be more visible. And I think probably social media helps with that. Very interesting. And I'm going to briefly summarize the two uh, latter questions that have come. Uh, through which um, take up on that theme. So the question from Karen here that, do you think that nowadays the Anglophone reader is expecting a, a more authentic experience? You know, have, have expectations of readers of translations changed because of how, to, how the amount of translation that's developed? And, um, and related to it, I suppose the previous question about globalism and in, in the age of globalism, this is from Monica Bellman, and, and the fact that people have easier and closer cultural contact with, with other um, write, writers and readers of literary works, is that a positive effect or, or, or how would you evaluate it? Oh, they're lovely questions. So um, <clears throat> I would say that um, certainly readership has changed. Readership does change. And um, if you imagine Constance Garnett setting out to, uh, to tackle these translations, um, there are a lot of people who wouldn't have read the text and, and wouldn't have known the, the um, salience of certain culture-specific terms. I think now that we live in an age of internet access, there is a, a slight sense that, uh, it depends on the translator, but some people actually prefer, some translators prefer to just be authentic and make the reader do a little bit of the spade work, which is a lot easier now. If you have internet access, mm -hmm. you can Google these terms. If even that isn't quite um, helpful, you can put it into an image and get an image of it. So our, our um, uh, ability to help things out and get a, a more authentic take on the text has increased enormously. Um, but there are things that, uh, in, uh, this probably ties in with the globalism, we're now getting exciting literatures from um, parts of the world which previously haven't been showcased, and it's really very exciting. So do you provide a glossary, for example, if there are lots of culture-specific terms, um, which uh, may be a distraction to the reader? Is it going to prevent the enjoyment of the text if you don't include something? So um, I think... Um, there is, that's the translator's call. Obviously, the publisher wants to have a say on that too. Um, Penguin didn't want them to use footnotes. They were, they were regarded as a, as a distraction. Um, and uh, Ria basically sent a message out to all translators, avoid footnotes where you can. I think um, probably Edmonds got around that by providing an, an opening note about Russian uh, naming protocols. Um, but and she did actually provide a couple more for her Cossack and Caucasian terminology, which would have been slightly uh, difficult for a reader. Maybe. But yes, it's, there's there's great excitement with globalism, and I think that uh, opens the doors to lots of uh, previously undiscovered literature, literary canons. But then it's also it's conscious translation decisions. You have to decide where your readership is at. I think to decide. Mm -hmm. Uh, to see whether they want your, the, a level of intervention or not. You know, it's, it's a very interesting question. And it reminds me of Joseph Brodsky talking about English readers' inability to distinguish between Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. And he says, yeah. well, the reason you can't distinguish between them is that you're not reading either, you're reading Constance Garnet. But, but I must yeah. say, I love Constance Garnet. I could read her all day, I don't have a problem. So I, I, I like the archaic, I, I'm not too hung up on. ADM well, I actually yeah. really take uh, the more I've looked at how uh, Penguin's translators strove for perfection, mm. and they had considerably more resources than Constance Garnet did, uh, and even then they didn't have a huge amount uh, compared to nowadays where you, we can Google everything. 
uh, the Clubton's Garnet's achievements are absolutely incredible. So, uh, and the sheer output, that's something we haven't yeah. uh, spoken about. But you know, but we, we can come back and talk about some of those things. I, I, I want to get through our questions because there's some very good questions here. Um, first, a, a couple of questions from, from Kasia Szymańska about um, the, the Penguin series insofar as they impact on other Eastern European uh, literatures and, particularly, and, and in particular poetry. Um, and, uh, and the question is, you looked at, um, you, you looked at the um, Penguin Russian classics, but and did you look to what, to what extent did you look at the way poetry is translated? I suppose you did mention Evgeny and Yegin, uh, but mm -hmm. any other um, aspects where Penguin deals with Russian poetry? Yes, well, um, certainly there is, um, there were, there are letters, there were quite a lot of letters in the archive actually, because readers had quite a view. Uh, certainly when Yevtushenko's poetry came out, there were some, uh, uh, there were pages and pages of a letter from just one person, listing all of the areas where it was felt that uh, the poetry was just simply not poetry. Um, and uh, they had sort of, I mean, it probably wasn't helped by the fact that Ria felt that uh, you should, you shouldn't attempt to recreate uh, the verse and the, the rhyme and the meter. So uh, it probably wasn't helped by, by that. You know, it, any translator approaching it with that in the back of their minds won't find it very helpful. But uh, the Yevtushenko poetry was uh, greatly criticized by one reader in particular. Um, and then of course, there's, um, th there is a hole in my book. I, I go into quite a lot of detail about Babette Deutsch and uh, the, the way that her uh, renderings of Yevgeny and Yegin were just completely, it was pulped in the end uh, because there was a, a slightly better placed person, um, a more consecrated person, Charles Johnston, who was going to give his own, but uh, it wasn't necessarily a better rendering. So um, mm -hmm. I have to say that, that it's obviously the novel form is the, is the form that was uh, produced most of all. So I haven't um, found as much on the poetry as I did for the prose. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Cathy. Some other good questions I want to come to. One from one of our own students, a uh, second year French and Russian student, Eilish Halligan. And um, Eilish is asking whether you think it's uh, a, help, a help or a hindrance that translators co collaborate with authors. And obviously she's saying that it doesn't relate to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky because they're not with us any longer. But certainly is the case, isn't it, nowadays, especially with the internet, that it's um, is almost de rigueur for say Olga Tokarczuk of the, the Polish um, Nobel Prize winner. We see huge numbers of people that her translators that work with her. Is it is it helpful or, or not? Or, or what, what do you see are the, are the pluses? I think it probably depends on uh, some personalities actually, because um, it could be a blessing. You could um, you could really hit it off, and uh, you'd be the perfect match. But uh, it doesn't. It's not a. It's not a full-on conclusion that you're a perfect match. And um, you know, certainly, what, uh, it, it, the, in the Penguin Archive, it's evident that um, the letter output increases massively once you start dealing with live authors. It suddenly gets very, very complicated. So um, the the difference between the letters uh, for um, the, the uh, Fenn, Magashak, Edmonds cohort and the next cohort where they've got live mm -hmm. authors um, it's quite remarkable so they they, they their focus changes uh, money needs to be discussed and uh, certainly Solzhenitsyn really had a view on you know he wanted to use that as a lever for making sure that Penguin tried to reduce prices to more Soviet style prices for his books being sold in the UK so um you know, that, that was a little bit of a thorn in their side. And, and yes, tr uh, authors obviously want to have some input, usually, uh, in how their books are going to be um, sent, circulated in the, in the global sphere. So uh, it could be wonderful, it could be really easy, or it could be very, very complicated. And, um, um, you know, there are, I, I translate, and uh, I, I think it's great when I have a good rapport with my author, but um, sometimes it can be a real, um, you know, showstopper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, I, I just want to come back to one of the other questions. Uh, obviously, you're in the field of translation studies and you've done a lot of interesting uh, research, particularly on micro histories, I guess, and the sociological and biographical aspects of the translation. And, and the question from, uh, from uh, Kasia Szymanska here is, 
to what extent th this work um, adds to or subtracts from or modifies possibly the debate around some of the critical theoretical questions in translation studies? Do you think that they, you know, in what way do they feed into it? What's common, what's unusual, if you like? I think it's a very interesting question. Mm, it to... is, yes, mm. it is. I mean, it builds, it was designed to build on um, the research thinking that's that's gone before. Uh, and really to tease out this element of the microhistorical approach. However, previously it's tended to be quite um, sole profession oriented. So uh, just looking at the translators or just looking at, well, rarely actually does the publisher get that sort of spotlight um, going through their letters and things and piecing it together uh, from a translation point of view. Um, but yes, uh, the, so it was intended to sort of throw the net a little bit wider and talk about the actual interactions and create, create a micro history that you know, sucks other people mm -hmm. in. But also um, what I realized was impossible. Uh, well, actually it was um, a, a joyous moment realizing that uh, Magashak had left a huge amount of his theorizing. It was a shock discovery in his mm -hmm. archive. Very rarely do, does a researcher get the opportunity to actually marry up um, so, a, a, a practitioner's um, sort of retrospective thinking over their career with the text themselves. So um, Simeone uh, has, has variously, uh, you can say that the view is leave textual analysis alone, it's time to move on from that. Whereas I decided to bring it back in because it just seemed like a golden opportunity that shouldn't be missed. And it actually revealed quite a lot of his, um, I could see his personality, his dispositions evidenced in the, what we call the surface manifestations of his text and vice versa. So um, yeah. I would say that's where it's slightly, it's uh, bringing something slightly different to what's been done before. Very interesting. Uh, um, just two questions before we leave. I'm just looking at the clock here and James is going to uh, instruct us when, when it's time to wind up. But there's two other interesting questions. One, one uh, uh, we should just cover this one off because we've been talking about Constance Garnet, but we never really characterised what it is about Constance Garnet's translations that needed to be erased. So <laughs> can you tell us a couple of words about Constance Garnet's work? You know, yeah, what was it like? I would also yeah. say that there's a there is a tendency for all translators, I think, to think that they, they are going to add the thing that was missing previously. So we mm. can all, you know, there, it, there's never going to be such a thing as a perfect text, not whilst the readership continues to change. Um, but with Garnet, the, the, the criticism has been that it is, as Connor's already said, there's one voice, uh, that she was not very good at uh, providing sort of a shift in, in uh, voice or polyphony. Um, there was also a sense that she perhaps glossed at times or she um, you know, wasn't, there are culture specific aspects that maybe weren't um, you know, noticed by her. Uh, and I actually do really feel that no one should have criticism for her, criticism of her for that because of the era that she was in and you know, what she basically had to get out there. So, um, so yes, that tends to be the criticism of her, but um, I think uh, the pendulum swings all the time. People tried to improve on Magishak's versions because they felt that, you know, he was very stilted and um, and then, you know, Fabio and Volkonsky feel that uh, he didn't capture the humour. He thought he captured the humour that Garnet hadn't captured. So yeah, yeah, it goes yeah. on. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, uh, one final question, and it's a very interesting one from Carolina Kaminska, which, which is about, you know, do you think that we, do we already have a canon of, of translations or to what extent can the canon be added to? So is there going to be a wave of new translations and, and if so, are they going to be more kind of atstranienia, if you like, more kind of like, I, I think, what's the name of these? Uh, there are two, um, uh, husband and wife, Larissa Valkonskaya and Richard Piva, Piver, which deliberately um, you know, present the, the stress and the strains and the uh, inaccuracies and logical um, non sequiturs of Dostoevsky. Do you know what I mean? So, so yeah. is that what we can expect from the new, new canon? I hope I've properly um, paraphrase well, Carolina's question here. Yeah, okay. I think, um, 
Well, I mean, time will tell whether there's going to be a, a swing away from the Pevio and Volhonsko style of translation. It seems to me that they've been, they've benefited greatly from having the backing of the big publishers. Mm-hmm. I also stress there are fantastic translations coming out through indie presses. Uh, and that's something that, that Russ Trans is very keen on um, publicizing, that uh, there are indie presses who publish the, what uh, the bigger presses would, would regard as slightly risky. Um, so the, there are wonderfully nuanced texts coming out from uh, much smaller uh, Russophone uh, areas of the world. Um, the sort of slightly ethnic approach to um, Russian language uh, so we have uh, Russophone literature from Kazakhstan, for example. But there are presses that publish these texts, and um, it takes it to a whole new interesting area, I think. Uh, so, yes, the, the classics will always be there, but there are these um, presses that are producing really wonderful translations. So Lisa Hayden um, is the key translator, Marianne Schwartz, there's Carol Apollonio. Um, so it's exciting. There are exciting mm-hmm. texts coming out. If, if people want to see some examples of it, we have, we uh, Rust Trans have seed funded twelve. Uh, so if okay. people want to see emerging texts, go and have a look on our website. Well, that's very interesting. It's a very positive note for us to finish on. So with that, I want to thank our speaker again. Thank you very much to Kathy McAteer. Just to recommend to everybody the book. It's a fabulous book. It's available uh, online for free from Routledge. Just go and Google Kathy's name and you'll find it. You'll really enjoy it. And there are some fascinating anecdotes and it's very entertaining read as, as well as being theoretically extremely interesting. So thank you for your attention, everybody. And uh, goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been it's been a super interesting talk for me. So uh, for everybody in the audience, again, yes, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, if you've enjoyed this event, then please do join us for future events. Uh, we run a very busy um, calendar of um, translation-based events here at the Virtual Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation. And you can see on your screen just now the um, the website. Uh, so you can get all the information about our events there. And uh, we also tweet and uh, we have quite an active Facebook page as well. So you can find out more about our activities there and please do. Um, If you really enjoyed our events and uh, you'd like to know more and get closer to us, then you can now become a friend of the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation, which means that you get to know about our events first and uh, you get many other different perks as well. So I hope you'll check out that link that you can see on the screen too. So uh, with that said, I'll look forward to seeing you again at a future event uh, very soon. And uh, thank you very much again for joining us. Bye-bye.